morning, everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. It's a few minutes after 8. We're going to start with Dr. Sean Kabusi. He's one of our PATH and Research Fellows, and he attended medical school at Baylor. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? I'd like to present some research that I was involved with during my last year as a medical student at Baylor and has carried over into my time here at Moran. It's Multifocal Interocular Lens Exchange. It's a case series of retrospective chart review. My mentors were Drs. Doug Koch, Bose Hamill, and Mitch Weikert, a one-time cornea fellow here at Moran. I have no financial disclosures, and Dr. Weikert has involvement with Alcon and AMO. So this was a chart review of 45 eyes of 32 patients who uh, wanted their multifocal lenses removed. Uh, all four types of lenses were involved, the Restore, Resume, Array, and Technus lenses, and they were uh, removed between July 2005 and March of 2010 at Baylor. Multifocal IOLs were first introduced in the 1980s, and they went through various incarnations in the following two decades, with the goal being to allow cataract patients to see at distance and at near at the same time without needing additional reading correction uh, they depend on the brain's inherent aptitude for multifocality, and uh, the different models of lenses have different diffractive or refractive properties to put two images on the retina at the same time. Uh, so he, this is the Restore lens by Alcon. It's a um, hydrophobic acrylic one piece with a near add of four diopters at the center, and uh, there are concentric apodized rings that surround it. Apodized uh, meaning a gradual tapering of the diffractive steps with the goal to create a blended transition uh, from intermediate to distance vision at the periphery. Um, in the middle is the uh, resume lens by AMO. It came out in 2005. Um, the center has a near add of 3.5 diopters, and there are five alternating rings of near and uh, distance refractive power. It's a three-piece silicone lens, and this is just a revision of the 1997 array lens also by AMO. And then here on the right is the uh, silicone three-piece Technus lens. It's the most recent. It gained approval in the U.S. in 2009. Um, it has a four-diopter ad in the center, and it had been available in Europe for uh, several years prior. So there are many studies out there that uh, conclude that multifocal IOLs are advantageous um, for providing superior uh, near vision without correction, without glasses, um, when compared to monofocal IOLs. Many studies also say that you get increased spectacle independence with the multifocal IOLs, comparable or increased patient satisfaction, and they don't uh, affect distance visual acuity, either with correction or without correction. But adverse effects are also well established. Um, decreased quality of vision, glare, halos, and dissatisfaction with multifocal IOLs have been reported in many subsets of patients in many studies and the decreased contrast sensitivity and the perception of optical phenomena result from the division of light energy between the distance and the near focal points. Uh, this has resulted in a trend that's been well documented by my bosses, Drs. Mamelis and Werner, in their yearly surveys of the ASCRS surgeons. Every time a lens is taken out for any reason uh, from an eye, um, a, a surgeon can fill out a survey and send it to our lab. Um, in the first year of the survey, dislocation was the number one reason for removing a foldable IOL. And this is still the number one reason, but now glare and optical aberrations have supplanted the other reasons as the number two reason for taking out a foldable IOL. And there's been a concomitant increase in multifocal IOL removal since that time. So with that in mind, we wanted to look at a group of patients, uh, 32 patients, who wanted these multifocal IOLs removed and gather the preoperative subjective and objective information, um, surgical information and postoperative information on these patients. Who were they, what were their complaints, and how was their vision before and after IOL exchange? Um, information was gathered from the chart. Visual acuity was converted to logmar to allow us to perform t-tests. Post-exchange visual acuity was taken at least six months after IOL exchange. In the patients that had um, additional treatments after I will exchange. We waited three months at least after the most recent treatment. Uh, many patients were from out of town, and phone calls were made uh, to their primary ophthalmologist if they had left town immediately after I will exchange. A survey was also mailed directly to the patients. 22 of the 32 patients responded, 
and we wanted to find out what were their uh, expectations for the multifocal IOL, how the IOL fell short of their expectations, what kind of discussions and counseling that they had received from their private ophthalmologist who gave them the multifocal, what kind of hobbies and occupations were adversely affected by the symptoms, and their quality of vision before and after, and if there was a trend in their personality type, if more type A's or type B's wanted the multifocals removed. Before Iowa exchange, the patients averaged 65 years old. They ranged from 47 to 78. There were 27 females, outnumbering males. There were five males. And uh, the majority were restore lenses, 31 eyes. But there were also seven array lenses, three resume, or four resume lenses, and three technus lenses. Um, of the 45 eyes that got multifocals, uh, 42 were a cataract extraction, but three were actually refractive lens exchanges. And uh, these multifocals had been put in by private ophthalmologists in Texas, Arkansas, and Louisiana, and uh, one case in Mexico. 17 patients with uh, bilateral multifocals got the same implant in both eyes, and one patient received a restore lens in one eye 2.5 years after a bonifocal in the other eye. According to the survey, 41% uh, of patients uh, decided they wanted a multifocal because they expected perfect, spectacle-free vision at distance and near. An another 36% wanted acceptable spectacle-free vision at distance and near, while the remaining 23% of patients would have been okay with using spectacles on certain occasions. A majority of patients felt that uh, their physician did not discuss with them the possibility uh, that there would be blurring, fuzziness, as Dr. Manlis calls it, Vaseline vision with the multifocal lens, but at least more than half did feel that they were warned of glare and halos. Um, patients were subsequently referred to Baylor for IOL exchange at an average of 10 months after they had received the multifocal, uh, but one patient came as soon as one month after, and one patient waited as long as 60 months after. Of note, about a third of the patients presented within fewer than 12 months. There were no systemic diseases that could affect the lens, the lens capsule or cortical visual processing, but 10 patients did have a remarkable ocular histories that could affect visual acuity with or without a multifocal, including glaucoma, Fuchs dystrophy, AMD, and vitreo macular traction. 15 patients attempted treatments to try to improve their visual acuity after they had had the multifocal. Um, patients with PCO got YAG capsulotomies. Three patients got corneal transplants. Two patients had LASIK. There was one laser iridoplasty for glaucoma, and there was medical management for blepharitis and punctate epitheliopathy. Chief complaints from the chart, the most common chief complaints by far, were poor visual acuity, blurriness, fuzziness, and optical phenomena like glare and halos. There was quite a bit of overlap. Many patients complained of both, and uh, complaints were homogenous among the different subsets of patients, whether or not they had an ocular history, PCO, uh, YAG, or donesis. Um, all four types of multifocal IOL elicited complaints of poor visual acuity, and all four types elicited complaints of glare and halos. Uh, a majority of patients felt that they experienced significant blurring at distance intermediate and or near. And in the survey, we define the word significant as um, impairment of most or all activities. And another 72% of patients felt that they experienced significant impairment due to halos and glare around lights. It was essentially a three-way tie uh, for the most compelling reason for these patients wanting their multifocal lenses removed, uh, poor distance vision, poor near vision, and glare halos. And in a follow-up question, six patients noted that night driving was specifically impaired as a result of the glare and halos around lights. Many hobbies patients felt were infected uh, by the poor quality of vision. The most common was reading, but also sewing and computer work came up, as well as painting, photography, golf, hunting, fishing, cooking, gardening and tweezing eyebrows. One patient noted in particular that the glare from the metal tweezers uh, made it very difficult for her to tweeze her eyebrows. 57% of patients call themselves type A, or very detail-oriented, and another 24% call themselves somewhere in between, while only 19% said that they were not compulsive about details. I thought the occupations were also very telling. Uh, these patients consistently tended to be well-educated, skilled, and specialized. Uh, there were two real estate agents, a symphony musician, a jeweler, an interior designer, a business developer, <coughs> photographer, funeral planner, salesperson, a housewife, and 11 retirees, including a secretary, an artist, a business owner, 
gift shop owner, electrical engineer, economics professor, teacher, insurance manager, airline pilot, and salesperson. Uncorrected distance visual acuity before IOL exchange with their multifocal was extremely variable. Um, it averaged around 2040 across the IOL types, um, but uh, the orange bars represent standard deviation, and so it approached 2070 in the restore lens at times, and even 2100 in the resume lens. Uh, best corrected visual acuity was better and a little bit less variable. It was uh, averaged around 2030. And of note, 17 eyes were correctable to 2020 with the multifocal IOL, uh, but these patients all mentioned glare and halos in their chief complaint for wanting the IOL removed. Uncorrected near acuity before IOL exchange was extremely variable. Um, it averaged around 2040 or J3, um, and it, there was a wide distribution of um, uncorrected near acuities from J1 plus all the way up to J10. Best corrected was much better with the multifocal IOL. Patients could be corrected generally to J1 or 2025. This is the surgery itself to take out the multifocal. Uh, this is a patient with an intact capsular bag. The haptics of a restore lens are being loosened from their fixations in the capsular bag. Then the lens is bisected and uh, removed with forceps from a three millimeter wound. And then um, an injectable um, foldable monofocal hydrophobic acrylic is put in the capsular bag and centered sutureless. 31 eyes had intact capsular bags and could receive their monofocal replacement in the bag. Um, but when the bag had been yagged, surgery was more complicated. 10 eyes needed the sulcus, uh, three eyes needed the anterior chamber, and one eye had their replacement lens sutured to the iris. A variety of anterior and posterior chamber models were used. Four eyes needed additional intraoperative procedures, including limbal relaxing incisions for uh, stigmatism, uh, capsular tension rings, anterior vitrectomy, and posterior parts plane of vitrectomy uh, for some vitreous prolapse. After eye will exchange, additional treatments were needed, including YAG for PCO. At times, it was leftover PCO from the previous eye well, or it was new PCO, um, PRK, and uh, more relaxing incisions for astigmatism. One patient had a pressure spike post op was treated with alphagan and that resolved. No patients had CME post-op, and one patient had a retinal detachment 16 months post-op that required a parse plane of vitrectomy. Um, she had an axial length of 24.68, which was bigger in terms of the patient's NARF study, but it wasn't huge. Um, uncorrected visual acuity, we added the red bars to represent um, after eye will exchange. There was uh, somewhat improvement, but it was still extremely variable. Um, in all lenses. Best corrected was more consistently improved across the lenses, particularly in the restore and the resume groups. Um, of note though, uh, three eyes did lose at least one Snell in line of best corrected visual acuity, but the other 42 either remained the same or improved. Best corrected near acuity also consistently improved, particularly in the restore group. And this is a busy slide, but I just wanted to point out the p-values that uncorrected distance acuity did not improve with statistical significance after eye will exchange, but best corrected distance and best corrected near did. The subset of patients with donesis before eye will exchange uh, almost reached statistical significant improvement, um, but five of seven eyes did achieve at least one Snell in line of, of improvement. According to the survey, an overwhelming majority of patients were pleased with eye will exchange. They felt that their symptoms improved. Um, 14% were displeased with eye exchange, but the majority were pleased or extremely pleased. So in conclusion, I think patients with and without ocular comorbidities who receive multifocal eye wells with cataract surgery may complain of poor visual acuity or optical phenomena such as halos and glare. And these complaints may not resolve with YAG capsulotomy. Treatment of ocular comorbidities, including invasive treatments like corneal transplants, or refractive fine-tuning like LASIK or spectacles. When the complaints are intrinsic to the multifocal IOL, surgical lens exchange is the only definitive treatment, although it is a last resort. And it's helpful to not rush to YAG the patient because then that would make um, the IOL exchange that much more complicated. Um, it's a technically challenging procedure. It may require intraoperative vitrectomy or follow-up treatments. In this particular group of patients, Uncorrected near acuity and distance acuity are both, are both very variable with the multifocal IOLs. 
Distant Acuity did not approve significantly after IOL exchange, but best corrected acuities did improve after IOL exchange. Most patients were alleviated of their complaints. So I think the bottom line is that not all patients will be satisfied with the multifocal IOL. Half of our studies had very high expectations of perfect uh, spectacle-free vision at both distance and near. And while it's true that in some studies as many as 84% of patients have achieved spectacle independence, it's probably better, as Dr. Mifflin says, to undersell and um, maybe offer a discussion that reflects some studies that say only a third of the patients will achieve complete spectacle independence. So with that in mind, I think our study adds to the 2040 literature that say that 2040 uncorrected distance vision is a common and expectable outcome with the multifocal IOL. 65% of the eyes in our study saw 2040 at distance, while only 25% saw 2025 or better. So putting my English major to use, if I were counseling patients, I would tell them that a multifocal IOL provides the ability to manage the majority of one's daily and social activities with more spectacle-free function than the monofocal IOL, and the ability to enjoy a combination of uncorrected distance and near acuities in the area of 2020. Uh, I would also watch out for patients with an occupation that require optimal contrast sensitivity, like the jeweler in our study or the symphony musician or the artist, any former myope that's accustomed to perfect near vision before presbyopia, or a self-described perfectionist who has high standards. Um, for some patients, 2040 could be just fine without glasses. They could get by with a near vision of J3. But for other patients, this isn't good enough and they would need glasses anyway. And if they need glasses with the multifocal, then that kind of depletes the purpose of getting the multifocal. And then all of a sudden, they're left with the intrinsic trade-offs, the glare and the halos, the poor contrast sensitivity, and they could be left wishing that they had their vision before they'd received the multifocal particularly if this was a clear lens exchange or an early cataract. Um, so finally, I would like to just offer a suggestion if I were seeing patients in a cataract clinic one day, if a certain patient walked into my office, what would I give them? This is my opinion and not necessarily the opinion of the other authors in this study. So this is the lady from the Devil Wears Prada. She's a fashion designer. Uh, she's keep reading the newspaper, the fine print, keeping up with the current events in the magazine, fashion articles. Um, she does the, f the designs, the materials, the fabrics, details, details, details. So um, I would consider her a less ideal multifocal candidate. This is a realtor. Uh, she's driving patients to properties at night. Um, she's checking her Blackberry, checking her email, typing up property listings, typing up contracts um, for the properties. A lot of computer work. I would call her a less ideal multifocal IOL candidate. This is a fitness trainer. Let's say 8 a.m. she wakes up and she goes swimming. Then she teaches a 10 a.m. step class. Then she gets lunch at the cafe. Then a 2, 2 p.m. step class. Then a 3 p.m. Pilates class and a 4 p.m. personal training session. Then goes home, has dinner with the kids. There's nothing about her lifestyle that requires perfect, immaculate vision at all times. So she could be a more ideal multifocal candidate. This is an extreme example that's loosely based on somebody that I know personally, my friend's dad, who absolutely loves his restore lens. He's retired, he's at a guitar store on a Wednesday afternoon. Um, there are really only two shirts you can wear to convey that you're laid back, a Hawaiian shirt and a leopard print shirt, and he's actually wearing both at the same time. So he might be a more ideal multifocal candidate as well. <laughs> These are my references, thank you all very much. Dr. Mamelis. This is a real important paper. The reason I say that is the literature has many studies showing that the multiple lens is extremely successful and the percentages of patent cases are very high and you never have to explain it. I go to meeting after meeting where someone stands up and says, I convert 80% of my patients to multifocal. I never had to explain one. And I always wanted to jump up and say, well, of course you've never had to explain it because they're upset. They're not going to come back in a few years. 
Yeah. And I think, uh, I don't know this for sure, but at the private ophthalmologist, they may have been yagged with as little as one plus PCO while the patients had very severe symptoms. You know, they felt blinded by the oncoming lights and the glare and the halos. And if, they, if that was attributed to one plus PCO, it's probably important to weigh the physical findings with the severity of the complaint. Dr. Ambadi. That's, that's based on uh, the patients in our study that tended to see 2040 uh, without correction. Your study is on patients that have the That's correct. So the 2040 is a mean or an average of the patients that were tested, not a mean or an average of the patients that were tested. That's correct. Uh, we, we don't know the mean of everybody. Uh, I did. Right. Um, and um, what fraction of the of other patients had pre-existing comorbidities such as glaucoma, hyperthermosis, genetic corneal pathology, or other conditions that would be contraindications during the medical procedure? Uh, Ten of the forty-five had comorbidities like those, okay. and, and those tended to have worse vision with the multifocal. Yes? What was the range of time from implantation to the next time? Um, ten, uh, ten months on average, um, but it ranged from one month to 60 months. Uh, Dr. Mamlis? I'd agree. Thank you. Thank you. That was an excellent talk. It was obviously a very important topic.